Life is hard. I think that's something that we all, at many times throughout our lives, would, would definitely agree with at some point. From the moment that we wake up each day to the moment we lay our heads down on our pillows at night, good things and bad things will definitely happen each day of our lives. I don't want to sound completely lopsided here um, with the statement. Good things definitely happen. We might get a promotion at work. We might get married. We might have a baby. Um, we could probably spend hours after hours with our families and enjoy each single solitary moment with it. These moments, though, are, are, are pretty amazing, and they're quite wonderful. The world is broken, however. It's something that we all are, are quite familiar with. For every good moment that we have, we might have a bad one. You might get promoted at work one day and let go the next. We lose friends. We lose families. The world is definitely a broken place. The life of a Christian, as we're quite, quite aware, is no different. This grand idea that your life becomes so much easier when you surrender to Christ, as we are all well aware, is, is simply a pipe dream. Each of us continues to feel pain. We continue to grow old. We still get sick, and we're all eventually going to die. We still sin. And we sin greatly. Over and over again, the cycle continues. Along with David, each of us this morning has probably asked the same question. How long, O oh Lord? How can we maintain hope? How can we maintain love and, and, and life in the face of this suffering and this death? How, how long can we live in this land of sin and evil. Not simply the sins of others, but the sins of ourselves, the sins of our own making. And this is a question, as we turn to our passage this morning, that Paul is going to answer, and I think he does a great job at doing it. So if you will, turn with me to our passage this morning. Romans chapter 8, as we read verses 18 to, to verse 30. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the spirit, the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called... He also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's go to the Father this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with, with great thanks, with great, with great honor. You are an amazing God. You are a glorious God. 
We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank that you, you predestined us. You've, you've, you've called us. You've justified us. You are sanctifying us. And ultimately, you will glorify us as well. We come to you in thanks, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we read through our passage this morning, we're going to kind of understand two basic concepts, two ideas that should give Christians great hope while we're on earth. The first of these is that we can have great hope, great joy, even while suffering. Because God has got our future already figured out. It isn't something that is simply slightly better than what we're facing now. It's a future that is so vastly better than anything that we can see now. That even our brightest days, those, those magic days that we have where everything's perfect, they're nothing in comparison. Christians can also have great joy and great peace because God is currently directing our lives not only in the future, but now. Even through our darkest and most horrifying moments, God is using them to grow us, to strengthen us, and to bring us towards Christ-likeness. Paul begins our passage this morning with a, with a pretty powerful statement. It's one of those statements that you can essentially use to almost sum up the entirety of Christian life. We're going to spend the next half hour or so kind of, kind of peeling back the layers like an onion so that we can truly, truly, truly understand what Paul is getting to here. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so this first verse is very much the heart of the passage this morning. As we look at verse 18, we can clearly see the comparisons that Paul is kind of, kind of making here. He's comparing the sufferings that we face today with the glory that is going to be revealed in the future. And as we can tell, these are two vastly, vastly different things. As Paul writes about our life on earth as suffering, I think this is something that we can all probably agree with. We'd all probably uh, heavily agree that the Paul, we, that we, we can't wait for glory. We can't wait to be in heaven. Where I think we kind of struggle with this idea is how we relate these two ideas together. For many of us, we, we be, kind of can begin with the second half of this verse. And I believe this does us somewhat a great disservice. Here's what I mean by this. So we can start by trying to picture heaven. We think of the best things that we can possibly imagine. It could be our wedding day. It could be time with our family, our, our favorite spot in nature, whatever, whatever you, you, you picture that is your moment. And we kind of try to relate heaven with that. And then we try to step back from there. But according to this verse, our current sufferings, they can't be as big as what we just related it to. And so we, we kind of become Stoics. If our sufferings can't be, you know, possibly be as big as this, then they're kind of down here. If this were true, then I, 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 I would, would end up trying to teach you how stuff how to stuff your suffering down, how to just, you know, get rid of it. The problem is, I don't, I don't think this is what Paul's getting at. Everybody in here can tell that suffering is a very real thing. You know it. I know it. We all know it. Just a brief glimpse into the Psalms showing that King David also knew about it. Whether it was outside influence or whether it was his own great sin, David knew full well about suffering and wasn't at all afraid to bring those sufferings to God. When Paul wrote verse 18, he wasn't trying to get his audience to become Stoics. He wasn't trying to teach them that suffering wasn't real or that it could you know, easily be ignored. He was calling them to Christ-likeness. And I'm not here this morning to attempt to explain your suffering away. It's a very real and it's a very powerful thing. Some of you are going through suffering that, that honestly, I can't even imagine right now. Um, some of you guys are going through great physical pain. It's hard for you to even be able to imagine um, or even, even come to the, into, inside the church building. Others of you guys are facing great emotional suffering and stress. You might have spent half of this week 
in the hospital. You might have lost family members. You might be going through suffering that you, you, you can't even feel like you can share with anybody. These are all very real, and they're very painful. As absolutely as horrifying as these truly are, Paul tells us that there's something else that's on the way. As hard and as painful as these memories are, Glory isn't just a little bit better. It is infinitely better than anything that we can possibly face currently. There's coming a day when suffering, the suffering is going to end. There will be a coming day where where God, as we sung this morning, is going to wipe away every tear. He's going to wipe away all suffering. And the children of God will get to spend an eternity in perfect union with him. But Paul begins to show us how infinitely better this glory will be, kind of starting in verse 19. He tells us, for, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, meaning God, and hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of, of, the, glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so let's think this through. We're going to kind of break it down for a few moments. Our future glory as Christians is so vastly amazing that even creation longs for it. Paul begins this section by telling us that creation was subjected to futility by him who subjected us. And this is an illusion for us and for the readers of Romans all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. So shortly after the fall, God tells Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall be of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you. So since the fall of Adam and Eve, creation has never, not even remotely been, like how God originally placed it. Thorns and thistles, dust and decay. Spring, summer, fall, winter. The universe is caught in a, 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 just a giant cycle of death and decay that has been its nature for thousands and thousands of years. As Genesis 1 told us, this wasn't always so. If we were to tra- traverse back to Genesis 1 and 2 this morning, over and over again, you would hear the words of God saying, It is good. Over the years, I've gotten to to travel a decent amount around the world. I've spent time in countries all over, from my time in Baghdad to tenting next to the Nile, from hiking a mountain in the Philippines to to living near the beaches of Spain. I've, I've kind of seen a lot of things, and they're absolutely and utterly amazing. The world's stunning. God knew exactly what he was doing when he created waterfalls. He knew what he was doing when he created, he lifted the the, the most beautiful mountains from the earth. He knew what he was doing when he created a system of of sun and water so much that it would make sunsets. It would make beautiful rainbows. It honestly, it's it's truly breathtaking. But as each each of us can attest, as beautiful it is, it's still broken. You simply just need to turn the news on for a few moments to hear about how broken the world is. We have earthquakes. We have typhoons. We have hurricanes. We have these cosmic uh, cosmic events that over time have taken millions and millions of lives. This world groans in quiet anticipation for what it once had been. Both Genesis in the beginning and Revelation to the, in, in the end of the Bible, they speak of this time when things are perfect when god is at peace with all of his creation not only man but but the world as well when things are once again like they were in the garden of eden but creation is not the only ones as we read that long for the glory of paul tells us like we don't already know this that we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, for the redemptions of our bodies. I'm 36. 
For some of you guys, that might seem a tad old. For others of you guys, you guys have grandkids that are older than me. I creak when I wake up getting out of bed. If I turn my neck to talk to Josh at work, I can feel like four vertebrae pop every time. My knees wobble. And for, for me, I have nothing on many of you guys. This doesn't simply, this, this, these passages don't simply deal with our, our physical struggles. It deals with our emotional suffering as well. Many of us are just, we're just simply worn out at times. Whether it's work, or whether it's family, or whether it's other things, we just, we just hurt. We might have invisible scars from the past that we just, we can't let go, we can't, we can't shake away. We might look back on our lives with, with just great regret. Why didn't I do this better? Why didn't I do that better? What if I would have taken this job instead? Did I raise my kids the right way? Did I do this? How would my life have looked differently if I would have came to church sooner? Many of these struggles looking back, they, they cause us to look forward to glory so much more readily. But not only do these verses hit both of our, our physical and our emotional longing, but they touch on our spiritual longing as well. And I think for, for me, this is a, a rather painful part of the passage this morning. It's probably quite easy to say that we, as Christians, we can't wait for our heavenly bodies. I'll be honest, one of the things I want to do is I want to be able to walk through walls. Like every time I read that passage, just lost. But we also want a body where there's no tears. We want a body where we're in a perfect relationship with God the Father. And that seems to kind of be the easy part. But the spiritual part of this promise can be a bit of a slap in the face currently. As Christians, do we really, really, and truly long for true Christ-likeness? And I think, sadly, for, for, for many of us, the answer is, is probably no. We're generally quite happy with the little bit of sin in our lives, or the great amount of sin in our lives. This is very much the struggle that, that Paul was pointing to out back in, in, in the chapter when he in, in the previous chapter when he when he talks about in, in verses seven to fifteen of Romans. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing, the very thing I hate. And this is coming from the apostle Paul. The spiritual life of a Christian can feel very much like an overwhelming experience. The Apostle Paul, Paul knew, knew, knew what he was talking about. And I think everybody in this room as well can probably kind of feel that as well. As believers, we're still sin. And we can do it rather well. In fact, I think if we truly look into ourselves, we'd say that we most, most of the time we enjoy it. But there will come a day for the followers of Christ that our sanctification, our Christ and likeness, will be complete. The true beauty of this passage, though, is that we're not on our own. Paul tells us in verse 26 that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, helps us in our weakness. I don't know about you, but that, that's a wonderful thing. As we've said before, as, we've, as we read before, if we were on our own, we would have no hope. So how exactly, you might ask, does the Spirit strengthen us? And Paul begins by telling us that the Holy Spirit it intercedes for us. As we're well aware, there are times in our lives where we go through great struggles. There are times in our lives where things are going wonderful. There are also times where things are so bad that we don't even know where to turn. We have sickness, we can have family struggles, we can have a lost job or career. It's times like this where we just throw our hands up, look to God and shrug. We don't have the words to pray. We might not even know what to pray for. But it's times like this where you, the world might call Christianity a crutch. 
as Karl Marx might have, might have said, it's, it's an opiate for the masses. It's just something, you know, that, that helps you out a little bit. And I'll be honest, at first I was kind of trying to fight some of these, these quotes. I was going to try to disagree with them. And the more I thought about it, I realized that Christianity, it's not just a crutch. It's not an opiate. The more I thought about it, and the more I study this passage, I, I, I think that almost the opposite is true. Christianity isn't simply a crutch that you, you know, helps you out. It's more like a wheelchair where the Holy Spirit pushes you around. Things won't always look pretty. If you go back to the Old Testament, the life of Joseph is, is quite a testament to that. When we talk about all things in a, in a, in a, in a few verses, he literally went through all things. Let's take a step back into his life for just a moment. How absolutely and utterly horrifying did his life seem? He was thrown into a pit by his own brothers. Those same brothers then sold him into slavery in a far, far away land. I can't even imagine the emotional, the physical, the, just the spiritual toil that he had been going through for these events. Then he finally starts to catch a break. And then the, the, house, of Hod- of the house of Potiphar, and that falls apart. He's wrongfully accused of an act he didn't commit, and he's sent once again to prison. Not a luxurious prison like, like what, what we might think, but a dungeon. He's probably going, what did I do? What did I do again? Like, I don't, I don't know, God. He spends a great time of, of there. And when he finally meets the baker and he meets Pharaoh's cupbearer, and he kind of starts to think, well, maybe it's the shot. And they forget about him. So he waits another couple years. And it's finally when he's out. And then, you know, he's, he's in charge of Edith for however many years. And finally he meets his brothers. The same brothers who many, many years ago disowned him, threw him in a pit, sold him, lied, told his dad, yeah, he's dead. But it's at this moment in time where he can, he can picture all of his life to this point. Each individual moment. Horrible, 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 horrible. And he's looking back and going, wow. I can see that now. And it's at this point where he's, he's talking to his brothers finally. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says to this, As for you, as he's talking to his brothers, you meant evil against me. He's not saying it wasn't evil. He lived it. It was horrible. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, Joseph wasn't the only one kept alive through this because of all this, this chain of events. His family wasn't even the only ones that were left alive. The land he was in, Egypt, wasn't the only one that were kept alive because of this chain of events. Essentially, at this point, it seems like the entire known world, that, that entire Mesopotamian area, was kept alive because of God, you know, put these events through. When all was said and done, Joseph understood that God was indeed with him throughout all of his pain and all of his suffering. Not only that, but it leads kind of to our final point this morning as we, as we jump back to Romans. Joseph, just like Paul, realized that no matter where he was at, no matter what he was doing, God was there. And God was using all of this for his good. So finally this morning, we come to our, our, our last section of our passage. And this is an absolutely astounding group of verses that's kind of become known as the the golden chain of salvation. So the fact that the Spirit strengthens us and guides us isn't the only thing that the, the Holy Spirit does in the life of a Christian. The Holy Spirit actually does all the work. Paul concludes in verses 28 to 30 by stating, 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And this is such a beautiful passage of Scripture for all believers in Christ. It's a passage that's so rich in theology as well. So you have pastors like Alistair Begg or, or Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones who could, honestly, they could, they could spend months and probably years going through each little word of these passages. And I, I love them. If, if, you, if you have a chance this week, check out some of their, their stuff. It, it's absolutely brilliant. This is not what we're going to do this morning. I, I want to, the goal of this morning is to, to look at this passage in the context of the entire section of what we're looking at. And it's a passage of a scripture that, like Alistair Begg points out, it kind of can become completely dislodged from the context. You know, so Paul begins with this, this, this final section by telling us that God works together, all things together for good, for those who love God. As we read in in verse 28, our minds are probably accustomed to going straight to the word good. This is a verse that we, we kind of use as a promise to ourselves. It's something that sells very well on a, on a coffee mug. But as I, as I read this verse this morning, I want to point out to you the two words that I think are the most important in this passage. All things. In these two words, Paul points all the way back to, to verse 18. God uses all things for the good of the individual to bring them to Christ's likeness and future glory. As we saw in the life of Joseph, this includes both good and the bad. It includes the happiest moments in your life, the moments that you will cherish until your dying days. It includes the mediocre and the mundane. Those days you, you just kind of forget about as soon as they're over. And it includes the moments that we will never forget, although we wish we could. The moments that are worse than our darkest nightmares. Each of these moments, each of these events are orchestrated by God to strengthen his children. As Americans, we, we, we don't tend to, to, to like this idea all that much. We tend to want a simple Christianity that simply benefits us. We essentially want to, to be able to run marathons without any training. We want to be able to go, go quarterback the Bengals without doing a single practice. But think back with me to, to whom this letter was originally written to. It was written, as, as Pastor Andrew pointed out last week, to the church in Rome. The church in the capital of the Roman Empire that would soon face great persecution. They weren't coming to Christ for the political or the economic or the, you know, the warm and fuzzies. They were facing the complete opposite, actually. For many Christians that were out in the world today, they tend to face the same issues and the same struggles and the same suffering. So for somebody in the church of Rome to read this, it would have offered them exactly what Paul had hoped it would. Hope. Not simply a, a kind of a hazy hope that things will get better in the future. A hope that strengthens them in the present life. The right now. A hope that would keep them moving forward closer and closer to Christ when everything around them was falling apart. So in verses 29 to 30, Paul gives us essentially what is a, a, a four-step process, you could say, in the life of a Christian. And this is what I said before, is, is considered the, the golden chain of salvation. It's in these two majestic verses that God shows us one final time how the sufferings of our present age simply pale in comparison to future glory. So it's in this passage that he also shows us that the Holy Spirit does 
all in the life of a true child of God. So for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of God, in order that he might be the firstborn among, other, among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Brothers and sisters, if you are truly a follower of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. It isn't a mistake. It's, it isn't something that you accidentally stumbled into. It's not something that you can accidentally or even willfully stumble out of. It's something that God the Father has ordained prior to the creation of the earth. It wasn't something that Caesar could take away. And it's not something that we can lose today. But as I began to read this passage a few weeks ago, two men kind of popped in, into my head from church history. And they just kind of immediately came to mind. The first one is a man who... We don't even know his name. He's a man who, frankly, was probably both a murderer and a thief. He led a horrible life. And yet, we can absolutely have no doubt, without any doubt, about his salvation. So as you might guess, I'm talking about the, the thief on the cross. As he breathed his last few breaths while dying... On the, crime, on the cross for crimes that he did commit, Christ saves him. Luke 23, verses 43 tells us that Christ said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will, see, you will be with me in paradise. I bring this, this man up for a reason this morning. As we look at these two verses in Romans, the, the chain of salvation, we, we can kind of get a, a, a little bit of ahead of ourselves a bit. Instead of hope, we can allow these, per, these verses to become something of a pride issue. We can honestly do it with each of these steps. The first of these, the first of these steps laid down in this passage is the one of predestination. And this is the word that can kind of get us into a lot of trouble at times. It's a word found in Scripture, though, nonetheless. Paul doesn't simply say here that you're, you're predestined to go to heaven. He doesn't say here that you're predestined to go to hell. What Paul tells us here is that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. So what exactly might this mean? Paul is showing us that true believers will ultimately go through each of these steps. True believers do not go through these steps out of our own strength. We don't go through these because we're, we're better or because we're stronger than anybody else. We go through these because... The Holy Spirit is working in us. It's delivered us. It's strengthened us. The other man I want to bring up this morning is a man by the name of Polycarp. If you know anything about church history, then you, you, you probably know who he is. He was a disciple later on of the Apostle John, and he was one of the early church fathers. Late in his life, he was, he was captured, and he would eventually become a martyr. When confronted about his faith, though, he gave a statement that, honestly, it sends chills through, through me every time I see it. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? And you probably can't find a set of stories more completely different than that of Polycarp and the thief on the cross. One man that was a Christian, you could say, for a few moments. His life would be considered by most to be a sad tale. The other man was somebody who had seemingly served Christ his entire life. Both of these men, no matter how they came, were predestined from the beginning of time to be followers of Christ. Not only were they predestined, but they were also called. The thief on the cross was called in one of the most extreme ways that we can possibly imagine. Have you ever thought for a second what his life might have been like if he wasn't a thief? What if he would have been a farmer on a farm somewhere outside Jerusalem? 
He could have been a nice farmer. He could have been a nice farm, farmer living on a nice farm. But would he have ever been in the position he was to hear the gospel and to be called by the gospel? Would he have ever been justified? So how does your own life relate to that of the thief on the cross? Each of our stories are uniquely different. Your calling and your justification might be very similar to that of the thief. Or you could live a life that, that sounds a bit more like Polycarp. In either case, no matter what the circumstances that God used to get you there, you can see the past. You can look back and see how he led you to the cross. And it's led to you being justified before a holy and wonderful God. In the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis speaks about this kind of a little bit in the, the book Prince Caspian. Toward the end of the book, Aslan, who represents Christ in the stories, tells, of, tells some of the characters, you come from the Lord, of the Lord Adam and the Lady Eve, and there is both honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the shoulders of the greatest emperor on earth. Be content. And I think that just fits so well with where we're going. Both the thief on the cross and Polycope, Polycarp both had the same issue. They were sinners in need of a savior. They were predestined. They were both justified before the Lord. The only difference in their lives with that was that of sanctification. And the life of a Christian is a long road toward Christ likeness. There will be struggles. There will be pitfalls. We don't simply accept Christ and then become perfect little human beings. If you've been in the church for more than a few minutes, you're going to have to agree with me on that one. Looking back again at verse 23, Paul tells us that we have the first fruits, the first fruits of the Spirit. If you've done any type of farming, you're, you're going to kind of know what he's talking about here. They're the, the, the first batch. They're the first taste of what is going to come. For Christians, when we receive Christ, we receive the first fruits of the Spirit. It's the first fruit that makes us alive in Christ. It's this first fruits while on earth that slowly but surely move us toward Christ's likeness. It's the marker, you could say, that tells us that we truly are sons of God or daughters of God. We've been adopted as sons and daughters of Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. We're simply awaiting our new bodies when you can say that we receive full sonship or daughtership into Christ. It's going to be this final transformation that Paul talks about when he mentions glorification. And it's this idea of glorification that brings our passage just kind of all together this morning. There's a reason that Paul both began and ended with this specific term. It's this glorification that makes everything worth it in the end. Not just worth it. To say that makes it sound like it's just a little bit, a little bit better. The struggles that we face are definitely hard. But glorification is amazing. What gave hope to the thief on the cross during his last moments on earth? What gave Polycarp the strength to go to his death, completely faithful in Christ? These men are not special. Polycarp could say that without a shadow of a doubt, that Christ had done him no wrong for 86 years. The thief on the cross knew without a shadow of a doubt that within a few moments, he would be with Christ in paradise. Neither of them could boast, though, how they got there. They couldn't boast about how much better they were or how much farther down the road to glorification they were. As Paul Christ powerfully states, the only thing that they could boast about was Christ. So this is why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 4, as we read this morning, we do not lose heart, 
Though our outer selves is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. So as we close this morning, we close with hope. When I talk about hope, I don't mean simply an abstract hope, the idea of hope. It's more than words. It isn't some, just some nifty little thing that we throw around. It's a way of life. It's fully relying on God no matter what situation that we face in our lives. It's definitely easier said than it is done. Just like David, we can, we, we can look to God in anything. We can go to him even when we have no words because he through the Holy Spirit is going to give us those words. Even if it's just simply throwing our hands up in the air once again and going, God, I have no idea what to do right now. I'm just casting myself fully on you. And honestly, that's the best place we can be in. But we rest in God and hope because like Joseph, like Polycarp, like the thief on the cross, we can look back and we can see how God has led us so far. And we can, lead, we can see where he's leading us in the future. Amen.